Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to go back and revisit the abandoned mineshaft that we found in the cave. And I'm going to bring a couple of things with me, notably logs and coal. And obviously all my tools and whatnot, but you know that already. Back in our starter cave, we're going to head straight for the deep slate levels. And I believe it was over here in this direction, which I didn't explore very far, which is why it's full of monsters. But I believe down here... Yes, we saw some minecart rails, which are a pretty sure sign that there is an abandoned mineshaft generating in this area. So while the skeletons over here are fighting, we'll hop on down here and you can see some cobwebs and some oak planks. Two more sure signs that an abandoned mineshaft is right here. And as we hop down into here, I'll quickly give you the coordinates of this part of the mineshaft that I have found. It's negative 130, negative 170, and also negative 36 on the y-axis. We are pretty firmly in the deep slate layers here. Abandoned mineshafts are effectively a kind of procedurally generated maze. There's a series of corridors that will overlap in different places, and as usual, it's a good idea when you're exploring one to put your torches on the left so you can find the right way back. This far down in the world, you will frequently find lava sources is pouring out of the walls, and in this case, this one's actually collided with water to form some cobblestone. We'll talk about that mechanic in a future episode. A zombie villager is shuffling his way towards me. We'll probably have to take him out and take out this zombie behind him. So typically in abandoned mineshafts, you'll find a few different things. There'll be oak beams and pillars all over the place using fences and planks. We can always break these down for additional wood if we didn't bring enough with us. And each of these corridors has minecart rails along the ground, which we can pick up just by breaking them, like so, rails can be crafted by the player, but it's kind of expensive to do so, so it's kind of nice to grab a few of them from here. And it looks like this mineshaft steps down here, but actually heads back out into a cave, so the natural generation of the mineshaft stops here. I'll still pick up some of these resources when I see them, though, so let's grab all of the redstone and iron that we spot. And if you happen to run into any of these cobwebs, you'll notice that your movement gets slowed down, especially while you are falling. It takes a while to fall through cobwebs, and a lot of the time you'll have difficulty interacting with your environment while that happens. So we can get rid of cobwebs in two ways. We can break them with a sword, which turns them into string. It is possible to break them with your hand or other things, but it takes a lot longer. Tipping a bucket of water nearby will also break the cobweb, turning it into string. So if there's a large area of cobwebs you want to clear quickly, that can be a good resort. But while we're down here and have access to iron, I've made a furnace out of deep slate. We're going to smelt two iron ingots, and we're going to craft some shears. Because the other option you have with a set of cobwebs is to shear them, which will actually drop the cobweb itself, allowing you to reuse that for yourself later. And right now, I don't believe it's possible to craft or acquire these cobwebs in any other way, so it's always worth gathering stuff like that, just in case you want to use it for a build later. As we explore the abandoned mineshaft, we will also run into these intersections with wooden pillars, and oftentimes there will be cubby holes behind these where creepers and other mobs could be hiding. So one of the things I prefer to do is take out the block at head height, just to check that there's nothing behind there. If there is, we can quickly attack it with the sword and run back, and then we can take out the rest of the oak planks here, turn those into sticks to use for torches or anything else we happen to need wood for. Breaking out the intersections like this can also be a good way of marking where you're going if you want to be sparing with torches, because if you come to an area where you've broken out the middle blocks here, it's clear that you've been through that way and you can look for torches that will help guide you back. A lot of these mineshaft tunnels will end up terminating in a dead end, though, especially down this low in the world. If they don't connect to caves or other features, they will occasionally just stop. In addition to that, there are multiple levels to an abandoned mineshaft, and frequently you will find that the tunnels overlap like this, creating some weird situations with hanging rails, but also exposing areas where you can drop down. So I'm going to mark this area with two torches just to make sure that we know which way we went. And one of the major reasons to visit an abandoned mineshaft is really all around us. They cut through the terrain, especially at heights like this and expose a lot of precious resources that you might not have been able to find otherwise. Like right here, for example, the mineshaft opens up and there's a new vein of diamonds right there, which incidentally got me over the line to 30 levels. Mineshafts that cut through the terrain like this can also expose veins of material, like the huge iron vein that we spotted previously, or amethyst geodes. But they have a little bit of loot of their own, as we can now see if we take a look down this passageway here. I'm going to block off that lava source, place a torch on the wall here to make sure it's lit up, and right here we have found a chest in a minecart. This is going to contain some loot from this abandoned mineshaft, which will typically consist of rails, torches, bread, occasional tools, and in this case, 
a golden apple. Sometimes you will find coal in these as well, which can be really helpful down here in the deep slate layers where coal does not generate. And the extra torches are often really useful to find as well. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you're stuck down in deep slate layers with a complete lack of coal, or if you haven't remembered to bring any wood with you, you can usually find abandoned mine shafts which will have a decent amount of planks and even log supports like this, which, if you break those down, can be smelted in a furnace to make some charcoal which will help you smelt some of the other resources you've found so far. You'll also find enough of them to turn some planks into a crafting table or some sticks if you desperately need to make more tools while you're down here. It's essentially a really useful resource for people who are stranded down here in the deep slate levels. We found another chest minecart here, let's open that up and take a look. This also contains some glow berries, which can be really nice to find if you haven't managed to locate a lush cave biome yet. There's a little extra coal in here, there is a name tag which we can acquire by fishing in a few other places, but you can also find them here in abandoned mine shafts. At this point my inventory is getting kind of full, so I'm going to swap the glow berries for the string and leave them in there. Here we go, this is what I was hoping for a little bit more of in this abandoned mine shaft. We have an exposed vein of diamonds, which if we open it up, looks like a decent amount of diamonds right here. I've got my fortune pickaxe on the bar, so let's go ahead and grab some of these. Six diamond ore total, we already had three, we've ended up with 14 diamonds from that little vein there, so that's going to be enough to make me a diamond chest plate and some diamond leggings. We'll finally be able to ditch the iron and the gold that we've been wearing, as long as we're not going to the nether anytime soon. But the final notable feature of abandoned mine shafts is something I'm actually kind of surprised we haven't run into yet, but if you hear the scuttling sounds of spiders nearby in an abandoned mine shaft, it is is worth paying attention to. Because if you see a high concentration of spider webs around, you have probably run into one of these. This is a cave spider spawner, and we are actually quite lucky that a torch has generated naturally in this mineshaft above the spawner, because these things can be pretty deadly. I'm going to shear the rest of the cobwebs from the outside of here, since we can grab those nice and safely, but we should keep an eye out for dark areas that might have appeared around this cave spider spawner, and as you can hear, there are a few spider noises around, so it's entirely likely that below here, a cave spider or two has appeared. Or that there are additional spawners nearby, because yes, cave spiders are around, and we need to be a little careful when handling those, since they are venomous. They will actually inflict the poison debuff on you, and right here, I'm going to cut through with the sword this time, yep, there we go, we've encountered another cave spider spawner in a corridor full of cobwebs. The poison debuff will not last for too long, but it's very important to keep your health and saturation up when dealing with that so that you can heal nice and quickly. Let's put another torch on the spawner just to disable it and try and take out any other cave spiders that have spawned in the vicinity. There we go, there's one. Like other spiders, they will climb the walls around here, so it might be worth looking around the ceiling. And my main concern is that there might be a few more of them nearby. Yep, there we go, there's a few of them that have spawned below the spawner, it looks like, down here here in this walled off section of abandoned mineshaft. The poison effect that they give you will not kill you, it will only take you down to half a heart of health, but then from that point on, any damage is a threat to you. If you fall off a block that's too high up, you'll potentially take lethal damage, so just be wary of your health at all times when you're dealing with poison. Oh, I thought I heard some more spider noises, there was one more lurking in a corner, there we go, and I'm pretty sure that is the last cave spider in this area. But I'm gonna clear out a few blocks of this mineshaft, because I need to show you something. Here is cave spider spawner number one, that is the first one we found, and as you can see the flames there are flickering, indicating that it will spawn spiders. Now we look at cave spider spawner number two, and you'll notice that that one is spinning and flickering as well. We have found an area in which two spawners are very close to each other. Both are currently disabled thanks to the light in the area. The torchlight will prevent mobs from spawning in that radius. But if you followed along with previous episodes in the series, you will know that we've already found and domesticated a skeleton spawner, turning it into an XP farm that we can use to gather experience levels and enchant some stuff. So the opportunity to have multiple mob spawners near each other is one that it can be worth capitalizing on, and in this case these are conveniently close to each other, to the point where we could funnel all of the cave spiders into the same place, swing at them frequently with the sword, and collect a lot of experience and string from that, since spiders will drop both string and spider eyes. And depending on the way an abandoned mine shaft generates, it is possible to have even more of these spawners in close proximity to each other. In previous worlds, I've even had five or six that are all in roughly the same area. So as usual, we are going to mark the coordinates of this, that's negative 155, negative 116, and negative 35 
on the Y axis. We are going to be back here at some stage to convert this into a cave spider farm. For now though, I'm going to continue exploring the abandoned mineshaft here. I'm going to grab what materials I can, but my inventory is filling up. We've got 21 diamonds to our name at this point, so it seems like it might be a good idea for us to head back. Stick around for the rest of the video where we'll do a little bit more enchanting and go and find another abandoned mineshaft for a second example of what these structures look like. Oh, wait a second. Before we go, before we go, I have just found a zombie spawner further down this abandoned mineshaft. From the spider spawner, which was really just over here in this corridor. There's two of them, one there, one there. There is a zombie spawner all the way down here. So unfortunately, with the 16 block radius of these mob spawners, it's not going to be enough range to get both zombies and spiders to spawn at the same time. But considering that the spawners have about a 10 second cooldown before they spawn mobs, it might even be possible to string together some kind of minecart track, which would allow us to loop around here, activate this spawner, have it spawn some zombies, and then loop back around there to spawn some spiders. Either way, we have a zombie spawner now, which is something we didn't have before, so I'll take the coordinates of that as well. We'll take a look in the loot chest here. We get another golden apple and a bit more gunpowder, and there are even some more diamonds in the floor of the corridor out here, so I'm going to grab those from here while I still can. All right, that's enough. I promise. Now we'll go to a break, <laughs> and now we'll come back and do some enchanting. Hey folks, welcome back. So I'm just getting in the door. We can unload some of this stuff that I brought with me. We're going to put the golden apples next to our enchanted golden apple, and I didn't bring back the other golden apple from the desert temple, so we might have to go back and get that another time. I think we will leave the rails up here. This seems like it's turning into more of a utility chest under our precious materials category. And the cobwebs, I guess, can go in here with the mob drops since they're associated with spiders. That is more or less it, but I think what you're all here to watch me do is turn 15 of these diamonds into some leggings and a chest plate, which finally we can complete our full set of diamond armor with. Since we have 31 levels, we're going to hop down here to our enchanting setup. We're going to grind a few more levels as we go, but let's take a look at what we get on both the leggings and the chest plate. Unbreaking 3 is showing up on both, so we have no idea what kind of protection enchantments we're going to get. The grindstone is here though, so let's see if we get protection 3. Okay, good, very good. The leggings will give us protection 4 as well, so all we need to do is get a couple more levels and hopefully that'll have unbreaking attached to it as well. Since a couple of the skeletons are spawning with it, I'll also take this opportunity to point out that chain mail armor is a thing. Although it's not a thing players can craft. The only way to acquire this is to get it from hostile mobs where it will drop as a loot drop along with some of their other equipment or to trade with villagers. Chainmail provides slightly less protection than iron armor but it does allow you to see bits of your Minecraft skin through it a little better. So if that's your jam then it could be worth upgrading a chainmail chest plate. And I believe you can repair these in an anvil along with some iron ingots although it might be a good idea just to put mending on it once you've got access to that. But of course, we're not going to concern ourselves with that right now. We are here for the diamonds. Let's throw that on the leggings. Protection for Unbreaking 3. Excellent stuff. We're going to equip our full suit of diamond armor for the first time. And you know what? I think that looks a little more stylish even than having armor trim on every piece. Having trim on just the helmet and the boots. Actually kind of like that. So now we have unbreaking and protection enchantments on three pieces of our armor with, of course, unbreaking and blast protection on the boots. So I'll briefly explain the difference. A regular protection enchantment will give you some extra protection against any sources of damage, whether that's creeper explosions, skeleton arrows, melee damage from zombies, or anything else that can damage you. Obviously, we have feather falling on our boots, which increases our resistance to fall damage, but the specialized types of protection, such as blast protection in this case, will give you an even bigger damage reduction to those specific things, just won't protect you from anything else. So if I have these boots on, I'll be much more protected against creeper explosions, but stuff like fire or skeleton arrows won't receive any additional protection from these boots. The general received wisdom these days is that it's good to have three different protection enchantments on the three pieces of your armor, and then a specialized piece of protection just to give you the edge on one specific type of damage. And my preference is for fire protection, because not only does that decrease the damage you take from fire and lava, it also means you stay on fire for a shorter period of time, which is really useful in places like the nether if you don't have have a block of water that you can dunk yourself in to extinguish the fire. But once you've got one type of protection on an armor, it isn't really possible to replace it with another, even if it's an upgrade in terms of the enchantment tier. For example, I can't put these boots in here with this protection 3 book and add protection 3 instead of blast protection 4. It's not going to work like that. I can, however, 
add a Protection 3 book to my chest plate to upgrade that to Protection 4. And that is the best chest plate we're going to have for a little while. Now, one last thing I'm going to do before I leave the Skeleton Spawner. Since we were generating so many bows, I decided I might try enchanting a couple of them in the enchantment table. And as luck would have it, we got hold of a Power 4, Unbreaking, and Infinity bow. We also got one with Power 4 and Flame and Unbreaking and a couple of other basic ones. But Infinity is really the enchantment I wanted. We're going to swap our regular Power 4 bow that's already looking a little bit broken for this Power 4 Infinity. In fact, we could also combine these to get Power 5. And with the exception of maybe adding Flame to that later, that's also kind of my perfect bow. Since Infinity will not consume arrows whenever we fire it, all we need to do is keep one arrow in our inventory, we can toss out the rest, and we'll be able to fire this bow for as long as we want to. And some people enjoy mending on a bow, some people like the fact that the tool is going to mend itself with any XP you gather and you never need to craft another bow, but the way I see it, you're always more likely to run out of arrows than you are to run out of durability on your bow, and I don't mind repairing a bow every so often if it means never running out of arrows in a dangerous situation. Speaking of dangerous situations, since there is conveniently one right here, I think it's high time we talk about how to fight Enderman. I'm going to look at this Enderman above the torso there, and if we look directly at him, he will freeze in place, so we can kind of walk right up to the guy without him damaging us, but then typically they will teleport away to try and disorient you. With this amount of armor on me and our new protection enchantments, he's not going to deal a great deal of damage to me, but usually if you're not fully protected, they will attack pretty hard. In this case, though, a couple of swipes of the sword, we've been able to take him down, and you can always block with your shield and melee attack them if you feel like that's a more comfortable rhythm for you. Endermen will drop Ender Pearls, which are both a vital resource and something that you can throw in the air to teleport to the location where it lands. For a quick example here, I'm going to try and teleport over to that hill over there. We throw the Ender Pearl, and as you can see, I appear where it lands, taking a little bit of damage when I did. That's probably the last time we will throw an Ender Pearl for a while, since they are relatively precious to us at this early stage in the game. But while we're talking about fighting Endermen, there are a couple of other things it is worth knowing. First of all, Endermen are three block tall mobs, which means they have difficulty reaching you if you're in a two block high space. Obviously with all of these zombies around, it's not exactly ideal, but if I look at this Enderman right here, he's going to wander up to this cubby hole I've made for myself, and while the zombies and skeletons and other mobs will make it in, he's going to have absolutely no chance reaching me. Just make sure that whatever hole you dig in the hill is two blocks deep and that you're standing right at the back of it, because they'll be able to swing at you if you're standing on this block, but not on this one. Endermen are also more difficult to aggro during the day, since they will teleport around a lot more when there is direct sunlight. But if you do happen to attract one's aggression at any time, they don't like going into water. They will try and follow you, but they'll always stop on the block right next to the water, and you have a longer range than they do with a swing of the sword or an axe. Bear in mind, though, that if you try and attack them using a ranged weapon, they will dodge your arrows and teleport away. If they're aggressive to you, they will usually return, teleporting in from a different angle and trying to reach you in a different direction. But if they teleport far enough away and pathfind away from the player, sometimes they will just give up entirely. If an Enderman accidentally makes contact with water, whether it teleports there or if it steps in, it will take a single point of damage and immediately teleport away again. Another strategy, but one you have to be kind of quick for, is that Endermen can be put in boats. If you see one running up towards you, but you put a boat down right as it's approaching, it'll get stuck in the boat like so, and will be immobilized, allowing you to take it out nice and easily. They don't even teleport away when you do that, they're kind of stuck as a passenger in the boat, so that's a really useful way of taking them down. But it doesn't always work super reliably. You do have to make sure that the Enderman is walking towards you and put the boat down right away, and sometimes they'll even just walk over it like that. So sometimes the best approach is just to dig a two block high tunnel in a nearby wall, or to attack them head on with some decent armor, a shield, a powerful sword, and some confidence. Anyway, from those brief skirmishes, we managed to net ourselves five ender pearls, and I'm going to put those in the precious items chest, and then we're going back to the desert. Only this time we're actually not here for the desert, we are going to head back in the direction of the Badlands biome. You'll also hear people calling these Mesa biomes from back in the day when they used to be called that, but they've been kind of reclassified recently since Mesa is more about the shape of the terrain, Badlands is more about the environment itself. But you'll see on the surface over here, this is something we noted in a previous video, we have spotted another 
abandoned mineshaft, except this one is a little different. It uses a different wood type for all of the beams, props, and supports. Dark oak wood appears in these Badlands abandoned mineshafts, and in this case, they tend to generate closer to the surface. Already I can see a spawner over here, a spawner probably in there, it looked like there were a lot of cobwebs down that corridor, and a minecart chest right here on the surface, which has another golden apple in it, so definitely worth taking that. At this point I might even take the chest minecart with me as well because those can be kind of useful. There is no need to light up this spawner unless it's going to get dark around here since it's generated on the surface and there is enough skylight to keep this whole thing lit up and prevent it from spawning mobs. But something tells me we will need to light up this one so I'm going to come in here with a torch really quickly, make sure I can throw one down on top of the spawner and hopefully that should be enough light to prevent any more cave spiders from spawning. It's always worth checking to the end of these corridors as well because sometimes they can generate a double corridor and another cave spider the spawner will be really close by, but it looks like no, this one just turns into a normal mineshaft corridor, and I'm actually kind of relieved about that. All around us in the Badlands, you will find these terracotta blocks, which are actually really pretty and come in a variety of colors. The plain terracotta is this one here, the one that looks a little closer to the clay flower pot kind of color, and if we harvest some of that, we can dye it different colors. Some of those colors occur naturally here in the mesa, but others can be acquired by grabbing this neutral terracotta color and dyeing them. Looks like we've spawned a couple of cave spiders down here, so there might be another spawner in one of these neighboring corridors. I need to quickly check around. Oh, not even. Are you kidding me? This is a spider spawner? And not a cave spider spawner, a regular spider spawner. <laughs> That's really quite cool. All right, let's pop a torch on that one as well. We can dig up into this. It's got a couple of loot chests here. We've got some name tags and bones, the usual sorts of stuff. Well, that is actually kind of fascinating. We found all sorts of spawners in today's episode, including a regular spider spawner dungeon, the last of the dungeon types that we had not previously encountered. And so it seemed like that cave spider just came from this spawner over here and wandered over to the area where the regular spider spawner was. That's kind of cool actually, that's really neat to have both types of spiders in the same area. And to clarify, this isn't necessarily a feature of abandoned mineshafts, it just so happens that this abandoned mineshaft has intersected with a spider spawner that generated very close to the surface actually. Typically you will find that those spawner dungeons generate further down in the world, or they are at least more likely to generate further down there, so it's actually very lucky that we found one this close to the surface, not to mention the surface cave spider spawners that we saw already. But another great reason to explore these abandoned mineshafts when they generate in a Badlands biome is that Badlands biomes generate a higher density of gold ore closer to the surface. When you are mining in normal terrain, gold doesn't really start generating until you get much lower in the world, but right here we are at Y47, we're only 12 blocks or so below the surface and there is some gold ore generating here in the wall. So we're gonna grab that. There is some more down here on the floor of this cave and in the wall right there. So seriously, there are three veins of gold each within about six or seven blocks of each other. The other minerals will also generate around here. So you're just as likely to find iron and copper as you are in any other terrain. But if you're looking for gold, it's definitely worth coming to the Badlands. Although this mine shaft also goes over into the neighboring desert biome where we won't find any higher concentrations of gold. And a lot of this is just going to be natural raw terra Cotter, which would be a good place to start mining for this stuff if you really want to. The loot in the minecart chests here is going to be largely the same though, the same sort of collections of bread and iron tools and rails and that kind of thing, even some beetroot seeds, which I don't think we've encountered yet, so I'll drop in a block of andesite and I'll take those home with me. But with 56 raw gold that we can smelt, a couple of bonus gold ingots from loot chests and that kind of thing, I think it's probably time to make our way home. I think the thunderstorm just started outside, it is definitely nighttime out there, so I'm gonna sleep for the night and we can sign off for this episode. And from in front of this spider spawner seems to be the best place to do that. So folks, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft survival guide. I hope you've enjoyed this look at abandoned mine shafts, which have treasures that you might not have expected otherwise. Thanks so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.